Thank you, Dr. Ward, uh, for that kind introduction. And I, I, it's okay. And the organizers for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure to give this talk here at the SID meeting, and to introduce not a hair follicle because that has been beautifully done by Valentina, but there, you're going to see the overlap, and we're really are going to go into maybe not so uh, something that has not been so uh, shown or investigated here, which is teeth and the focus of ectodermal dysplasias, which is um, the f focus of my laboratory. So here. So um, the, the work in my laboratory has focused on uh, a study of animal models of ectodermal dysplasias. It's a group of congenital syndromes characterized by abnormal development of tissues that have uh, ectodermal origin, the skin and its appendages, hair, teeth, nail, and sweat glands. So the molecular basis for specific EDs has been determined, uh, such as the case for P63, and there's uh, McGrath and Maranke Koster. And the, in, in my laboratory, as Dr. Worth said, we have focused on uh, a homeodomine transcription factor called DLX3. Mutations in DLX3 are linked, as shown here, with D, oh, sorry. Okay. Mutations uh, are, are linked, okay. So, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry about that. It's going back. Okay, so mutations in DLX3 lead to uh, an ectodermal um, dysplasia syndrome called TDO, which stands for trichodental osseous syndrome. It's characterized by defects in the hair, the, which is brittle, coarse hair that breaks very easily at touch, and severe enamel hypoplasia. Other clinical features that characterize this ectodermal dysplasia are uh, thin, brittle nails. I, I'm sorry, I just keep on messing up. Okay, so I'm not going to go too much into this because uh, it's been alluded to in the previous talk, and uh, uh, there's a a substantial amount of work in the last two decades of common signaling uh, pathways that are involved in the reciprocal signals between the epithelial and the mesenchyme. And that these are common signal pathways that are conserved between hair initial, initial hair follicle development and tooth development. So an important pathways that have been determined to be really important are BMP, Wnt, Sonny Hedgehog, uh, F, FGF, EDAR, and most of them are, have been worked in with people that are in the audience. But I will try to really um, reemphasize what the, what the approach that we took. So knowing that it's not intuitive to, that when you compare the final structure, um, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I keep on pointing here. The final structure of a hair compared to the final structure of the surface of the tooth, which is the enamel, it's really not intuitive to say they are structurally similar. So, but let me go into common and different features of hair and tooth. So for the hair you have, the final product is the hair shaft, which is composed primarily of hair ker hard keratins, hair epithelial keratins. And for the formation of this, there's important supportive tissues, such as the inner root sheath and the companion layer, that are important for the formation of the hair and for the final um, differentiation. In the context of the tooth, you have different, and I'm going to go a little bit more in detail here, the dentin, which is uh, a product of cells called odontoblasts, which is the dental mesenchyme, and enamels, which is, prop, is the ectodermal-derived tissue, which is a, a product of the ameloblast cells. So compare, and how does the enamel look? And this is why I'm going to go a, a little bit in detail. Each ameloblast creates one enamel rod. Enamel just basically is 99% mineral. It's hydroxyapatite. The final structure looks something like this. is a lattice of intercalated inter uh, rods and interrods. But importantly, each of these rods is surrounded by uh, what is called an enamel rod sheath. It's organic. Uh, organ enamel organic material, and it's known to be, even though it's just 1% of the final enamel mass, it's really uh, crucial for the mechanical uh, um, uh, strength of the enamel. 
It's a highly cross-linked material and very insoluble, so it's been very difficult to characterize. And in some way, I always try to correlate different tissues and, uh, that we work in. It's almost like when we thought the cell envelope, a highly cross-linked structure that was very difficult to determine the components. So having um, compared both things, so the commonalities and the different features of this, what I would like is to stress that what I'm going to propose is that even though they look very different at the end, structurally, there is a common uh, architecture pathway that is very similar between hair and tooth. So the goal of my laboratory is, is to understand the common mechanisms and structural features underlying ectodermal appendage formation, both in normal development and in ectodermal dysplasias. So, First, starting and correlating it to what I initially start, uh, um, mentioned, the function of DLX3. This transcription factor is expressed in the differentiating epithelia in the hair matrix cells of the hair follicle in both compartments, the epithelial and mesenchymal component of the tooth, because the dental mesenchyme of the tooth is of, of a brachial arch origin. But going first into the hair, we demonstrated several years ago in ongoing work in the lab by, uh, by Jean Chul Kim, have demonstrated that DLX3 is, is an important regulator of differentiation of the hair shaft. Well, by ablation of DLX3, epidermal deletion of DLX3 results in a normal hair shaft formation that leads to complete alopecia. We set out to determine the set of signaling paths through which DLX3 is exerted in its function, and we found that it's a very upstream regulator, and a very important, crucial, and that it's directly controlling other transcription factors known to be important in hair development, such as HOXC13. But importantly, what I would like to stress here is it is directly controlling the expression of hard keratins, such as keratin 32. In parallel, trying to understand then these developmental or, or structural commonalities between hair and tooth, we have, we have uh, engaged in doing both dental and epithelial deletion of DLX3 in, in, in tooth during development. So I'm going to present the work primarily of the dental epithelium, where the cells, the ameloblasts, which are cells that are producing the enamel, are of epithelial origin, and we delete specifically DLX3 this, in this fashion, using a K14 Cree driver. So the result in the mature tooth, and this is a molar of the, of the, of the, of the wild type and control mice, is that it results in a very hypoplastic meaning very small and very dysmorphic. So the normal lattice that is present in the wild type is completely disrupted in, uh, in, this, um, uh, in, in this mutant hydroxyapatite latus. So one of the problems that we have with a tooth is that it's a final structure. And this, I'm going to just go very quickly through the distinctions between the regenerative capacity that we have between hair and tooth. Hair cycles throughout the life, but in tooth and probably in most mammals, you have just two cycles, if you will, the primary and the permanent dentition. But an advantage of using the mouse is that they have a continuously growing uh, tooth, which is the incisor. The ability of uh, focusing on the incisors is that you can uh, address the, develop, the, the differentiation of the ameloblast, the formation of the enamel, the mineralization, et cetera, at different stages of progression and do that continuously throughout the life of the, of the, um, of the animal. So focusing, m many of the work that we have done has been done by doing uh, or isolation of the enamel organ and dental epithelium in the incisor of the mutant mice. So we, uh, the first thing we did is we performed transcriptome analysis of dental epithelium of the conditional knockout, in which we have delayed a DLX3 in the dental epithelium. And to our really big surprise, we found that one of the most, uh, of the most uh, significantly downregulated uh, genes were hair epithelial keratin, specifically keratin 25, 27, and keratin 75. We later further corroborated the surprising finding 
by uh, independent RNA-seq approach in which we show that complete absence of the keratin-75 expression compared to the unaltered expression of normal epithelial keratin such as keratin-14. So the, the, these, have, these really impacting results or at least a very, a very interesting to us, have two major points. That epithelial hair keratins are expressed and are present in tooth, and expression is dependent on DLX3 functions, similar to the hard keratins in hair. So we determined the complete profile of keratins expressed in the dental epithelium, and I have highlighted them here in in blue, all of these keratins in both clusters of the type 1 and type 2 keratin are expressed. Significantly, there's two points. None of the hard keratins are expressed in tooth. It's specifically the epithelial keratins and these epithelial hair keratins that are primarily in the sheaths. And um, only some of them were dependent on the LX3 expression, keratin 75 keratin 71, 25, and 27 in the context of the tooth. I will focus the rest of the talk in keratin 75, and I will give you the rationale of why we focused on this. So the first thing was to determine that the protein, the keratin 75 protein, was detect, expressed and detected in the differentiating ameloblast. So doing a longitudinal section in this differentiating dental epithelium, we found that keratin 75 was very highly expressed and detected in the differentiating ameloblast. And it overlapped in some part the expression of the keratin, epithelial keratin 14 expression. So um, we, uh, a beautiful work that had been published by doctors uh, Jiang Chen and Dennis Roop showed the relevance of keratin function in mice. And I will also allude that relevance of keratin 75 in chicken. So uh, uh, Dr. Chen and Roop generated and characterized the mouse a model where they had the deletion of a highly conserved aspar asparagin in a position that is really important is in the initiation motif of the helical, helical domain of keratin 75. This caused uh, se se severe hair uh, defects, as can be visualized here at the bottom part, pigment clumping, uh, breakage, and, uh, and fragility. So um, in the context of the chicken, in another type of ectodermal appendage, there was beautiful work published by Dr. Uh, Qingming Chong, in which they, he, they determined that the cause, the mutation that caused frizzle feather was a 69 base pair in-frame deletion in a conserved region of keratin 75, further supporting that keratin 75 is really important in building the architecture of these skin appendages. So the, the initial question that we had was very simple. If, if what we're proposing is that there is this uh, similar or parallel architectural path that these two appendages are, are following, it does the keratin 75 mutation have any present, uh, mouse present any enamel defects? So uh, Dr. Jen, Ken, Jen, Chen and group kindly provided the mice and in response to this, uh, I'm having a lot of problems. Okay, the, the keratin 75 mutant mites have altered enamel structure. As you see, this is the normal enamel rod lattice in the wild type mice, and you can see that it's completely disrupted in the mutant mice. So, to further support the important role of keratin 75 in the architecture of the hair, we uh, we, uh, group, the group of Jurgen Schweizer uh, with uh, Herm Hermalita Winter had, had shown that keratin 75 mutations are associated with a uh, hair disorder called folliculitis barbie. It's a hair disorder characterized by the formation of ingrown hair upon shaving. It's, it's uh, very prevalent in the population. I will give you the statistics in a while. And it's very prevalent specifically in African Americans, probably due to the in, uh, inherent curvature of the uh, African American hair. 
It's a G to A missense polymorphism that leads to an alanine to threonine substitution in the highly conserved region of the 1A domain of the keratin 75. So uh, the, the, uh, giving you a little bit of background, um, this work was done by isolating uh, hair and studying patients in a naval base in Germany. And uh, it was an American base, and uh, I'm giving you a little bit of background, is because they need to shave very closely. So they develop a lot of, uh, a lot more, the people that are prominent or had this, um, this polymorphism led to more, uh, um, the phenotype of folliculitis barbae. So, um, and uh, also in, in Jurgen Schweizer's lab, uh, Lutz Langbein had done a very beautiful characterization and de determination of all the hair care, hard keratins, hair epithelial keratins, and showed a beautiful immunohistochemistry showing the specific expression of keratin 75 in the companion layer. So what is the expression in the hair uh, keratins in the mature tooth? So for this, we prepared polished human mature, this is in human, human teeth, and we did with several different keratin 75 antibodies immunohistochemistry, and we showed that there's a specific detection in keratin 75 in the enamel portion of the tooth. It's completely absent in the dental, in the dental region. Here you see separation in the dental enamel junction. Importantly, this is each one of these is the hydroxyapatite rod. What we see is that the expression is really restricted to this organic, uh, enamel organic sheath that surrounds each one of these uh, enamel rods. So the hypothesis we placed at that at this moment was that the mutations in keratin 75 would be associated with enamel defects in human dentition. And for this purpose, we tried, we just, decided to establish several ways of characterizing or studying, determining if this hypothesis was correct. But for, to study the consequences, then we were going to analyze the organic material, study the enamel hardness, the structural enamel defects if they appeared, and as function of the enamel being the protection of the tooth, if, this, if there were defects, if they gave them a higher susceptibility to develop caries. So since this is something that we don't see very much here in the, in the SID, I'm going to go a little bit of how we do this. So this is a molar. Uh, the, uh, we also established, just before I go into it, a collaboration with the Naval Hospital, which is across the from it. And they actually re, um, uh, encourage young recruits to um, extract their wisdom teeth. So we had a really nice resource of very nice human teeth for this project. And it sort of was control. We have, since it's an American base, we also thought that the proportion of African American, et cetera, in the pool would be very similar to the work done by Hermalita Winter. So the first, uh, the first assay was to, uh, to assay for the presence of the mutation. And as I said, it was, it's very prevalent. It's about 20% in the population. And uh, once the presence of the mutation was identified by very um, dentist um, <laughs> type of procedures using a diamond disc and chisel, Olivier Duverdier in the lab, who has spearheaded all this work, uh, separated uh, different parts of the tooth to be able to do is our isolation of organic material, preparation for hardness testing, and preparation for scanning electron microscopy. So before going in that, how do we isolate this organic material from this enamel, which is the most highly mineralized tissue in the body? So there is the procedure in which you basically can demineralize the, 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 the tooth. You put it in at a high temperature with EDTA, and you basically, at the end of a couple of weeks, what you have is just the specific organic material. Before going any further, I really want to emphasize that this organic material just is 1% of the enamel. And it's highly, very highly cross-linked and insoluble, but it's indispensable for the mechanical strength of the enamel. 
The enamel has to be very, it is very hard. It's, as I said, the most highly calcified um, um, tissue in the body. But at the same time, it has to have certain uh, flexibility to be able to withstand the mastication throughout the life of the individuals. So the first point was, I, after isolating the organic material, we did uh, DIC um, uh, imaging, and we saw that the, there was an altered material in the organic material. I hope it's clear that this is the normal tuft and organic material uh, uh, a, a, um, structure that basically it collapses on itself. So it seems like when the mutation is present, this organic material is not the same structurally. We then proceeded to determine if the distribution of the keratin-75 staining was disrupted. And as is shown in, this immune, uh, in, in these panels, when we compare the expression of the keratin-75 in the, in the control patients versus the ones carrying the keratin-75 mutation, we see there's a disruption in this um, uh, staining. So for the second point was to, to determine the enamel hardness. This is basically done by a technique called nanoindentation. You just basically put some pressure and are able to dis measure the area that is of the impact. This is done very much by structural, uh, by people that study structure and hardness in, in different tissues. So we proceeded to do the nanoindentation technique, and this led us to determine that the mutation in keratin-75 led to a dose-dependent decrease in the enamel hardness. So with the homozygote being significantly high, less, less um, hard than the, um, than the wild type and the heterozygote. For the structural enamel defects, we see that the mutations in keratin-75 cause defects in, that are visualized as thin tubules or cracks and holes going through, going through the enamel. So these are cross-section and, longitud cross and longitudinal sections of the tooth. This is a wild-type tooth, and as, if you see the magnification, this is the normal pits and fissure pits that are in the surface of the tooth, and you see that there's no holes or anything in the enamel when you go to a cross-section. This is the mutant enamel, and as you see, there's, an, uh, there's cracks that go all the way from the surface going directly to the dentin, making it a perfect conduit for the entrance of bacteria into the tooth. And even though it's, I, I hope it's, not, it's clear, but there's a very significant high number of holes in, when you see uh, in the cross section. And we'll see that a little bit easier in the next couple of slides. So this is a 3D micro CT reconstruction showing the thin holes uh, that are present in running throughout the enamel. So this, uh, the, what we, the way we do this is by density, the enamel is more dense. So we're able to subtract that from the micro CT image. So what you're seeing is the surface of the tooth, which is more hydrated, so you can see that. You're, the enamel is, em, is empty, and then you see the dentin. So basically, these are the normal pits of, of the molar. What you see in this compounded 3D micro CT reconstruction is that there's a significant higher, or many number of these tubules that are connecting the surface of the tooth to the dentin. Okay. And let's, let's hope that this uh, can be, because these videos are, I think it's sort of like the, we were just discussing the, uh, the movie, old movie, the voyage through the, <laughs> so basically you're going to be going through the enamel. This is a cross section of the tooth. So as it's clearly here, you see no connection. While here, you see not only that there is the connections, but there's a huge number of connections, and it is also proportional depending if it's a heterozygote or a homozygote carrier. So finally, to determine if the keratin 75A161T uh, mutation had clinical impact on enamel function, we established a collaboration with John Schaefer and Mary Maracita in the University of Pittsburgh, who had performed a genome-wide association can, scan for dental caries in permanent and primary dentition. 
So we tested for the genetic association between the polymorphism and tooth decay, and this assays assessed as dental caries in both primary and permanent dentition. The missense A allele was very prevalent, as I mentioned before. It was about 22% in the population and was associated with a significantly higher number of caries, in, and it was also dose-dependent. Surprisingly, the, the mutations in keratin-75 were not associated with cavities in primary dentitions. This leads us to a, 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 an interesting possibility that there is a different subset of epithelial keratins that function in the primary and in the permanent dentition. So scanning electron microscopy to clearly show the structural defects in teeth with the keratin-75 mutation Comparing it to the wild type control, or, or the control, we see that there's numerous cracks and holes that in some cases you could see was associated with demineralized enamel. This is typical, uh, this is the, the typical vision that you have in initiation of caries. Actually, there was an area that looked like there was already bacteria in this hole. To, to, collect, to corroborate this, we did a gram positive staining, and this showed that the holes and cracks present in the teeth of the keratin-75 mutation contain bacteria confirmed by gram-positive -po staining. So in conclusion to the work I've shown you today, hair and tooth are known to share a series of developmental and epithelial mesenchymal reciprocal signalings, and that has been established by many labs in the last decades. But here, they are, I'm, I'm trying to put support that we are really, with this work, we're trying to show that they share important structural features. The um, hair epithelial keratins are part of the enamel organic material. This was really surprising to us, and now it is going to be very interesting to see what are the functions of the other hair epithelial keratins and epithelial keratins within the enamel organic material. Mutations specifically in the keratin-75 are associated with enamel defects, and functionally these mutations correlate with increased dental decay risk. So I want to leave you with uh, uh, the, these beautiful images of the ultrastructure, both of hair and tooth, and to really emphasize that even though intuitively they don't look so similar, maybe they are, and that we have provided really uh, strong supporting uh, evidence that they share uh, a, maybe an architectural pathway and that the way that these structures are formed is very similar as well. And it will be, it's, it's, it's interesting to anticipate that mutations in the other epithelial hair keratins will also be associated with enamel defects. Sort of strengthening that there is really going to be the possibility of the overlap of dentistry and dermatology and the communication in many diseases that the dentition defects have not been really well characterized. It's going to be a good way of fostering that interchange. I would like to finish by really um, thanking and highlighting the past and current members of my laboratory. And um, it's really always just they're a great group of people, fun to come and work with them every day. And to highlight specifically two people, the staff scientists Olivier Duverger and Takahiro Hara, who's now an uh, MD-PhD student in WashU. These two people. They are the two people that spearheaded and basically did most of the work that I presented from my laboratory. These are collaborators on ongoing projects in the laboratory, and specifically for this work that I presented today, Mary Maracita, John Schaefer, and Elia Binash from the University of Pittsburgh. And I would like to, again, be um, thankful to the intramural research program of NIAMS and NIH who basically supports the work in my laboratory. Thank you very much.